Good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks for joining today. And I see you've got a good crowd, and uh, I see our friends uh, in Ogle at, in the big booth there, and uh, uh, our other groups of folks that uh, are uh, in room together. So uh, great to have a good crowd here today. Uh, this week is survey week, and uh, uh, community survey is one of the bigger tasks that your communities uh, want to really focus on to get, go, uh, get quality information from your community about existing broadband services and uh, uh, people's satisfaction with those, interest in better uh, services. And so... Um, uh, it's a big task, and we hope that each community can get enough surveys from around their county so that you're both geographically diverse, uh, get, getting information from all over, and enough so that it's a, a good sample. I hope that uh, folks had an opportunity, uh, at least the uh, overachievers in the crowd, like Skyler, to uh, uh, go out and do watch that uh, webinar in advance from uh, one of my previous clients, the Blandon Foundation. They're really, uh, we created this uh, program together and there's some great content there. A gentleman by the name of Doug Dawson, uh, who runs a consulting firm, CCG, uh, talked about uh, broadband surveys and he's been doing those for 20 years. And so there's a lot of, uh, different approaches to doing that kind of surveying. And uh, so I encourage you to, if you have time, if you haven't watched it, and especially if you're actively leading your team here in your information gathering phase, uh, to go back and take a look. But he talked about the difference between, you know, of surveys is one way to do this and statistically valid uh, sample surveys. Uh, to go out and do a canvas, which is, uh, I think Nancy calls that more of a friendly sample, uh, where it's how many, you know, trying to get as many surveys into the hopper as you can. Uh, some communities do a, a broadband pledge drive that says, you know, asking people to sign their names. I will subscribe. If you bring internet, I will uh, subscribe to it. Uh, uh, interviews with key folks in the community. Uh, the speed tests, and then uh, another technique of asking people to bring in their bills, uh, customer bills, so that you can actually see what are people uh, paying for, what's the price range. We often think that there's a price that everyone pays, but depending on when people have signed up or renewed or called in and threatened to quit, you know, everyone is paying a different price. And so looking at those bills, and especially when you look at some of the business uh, kind of uh, uh, sub subscription prices, that can really be a great uh, strategy to take a look at. Nancy is our survey master, and she has uh, done a great job in now about a dozen or more communities helping them go through this community broadband survey. And so she's gonna take the lead today um, and, and share her perspective as to how to do this in the best possible way to be able to get the results that will really uh, help you make decisions later on down the road as we get into our planning processes. And then we also have a, a special guest, a friend of mine, uh, Barbara Droger Klein. Uh, she lives in uh, Lesur County, Minnesota, south of the Twin Cities in a corn and beans uh, growing area. Also kind of home of the Jolly Green Giant. Uh, uh, and so a lot of peas and uh, at least there used to be a lot of peas in Lesur County. And uh, uh, she's going to talk about the ways that over the past several years, they've done multiple surveys and uh, and, and uh, made productive use of those for grant applications and working with broadband providers. So uh, Barbara, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks, we'll hear more from you in a little while. But Nancy, I'll turn it over to you and uh, say thank you for all the work that you do with the communities through this process. 
Thanks, Phil. Uh, let me share my slides and then we'll get started. Tell me how that looks. Great. Great. Okay. Um, so just a, a brief sort of follow up with everybody. I'm going to go ahead and move to this next slide so you can see who I am. And these slides are also just going to be uh, something that you can use to have some of the information there. Um, I will share two links. Uh, there are download links that you can use after this presentation. One is the slides and the other is um, a document that should serve as a tool to help you launch. Um, I've had some great feedback so far. I've heard from most of the counties on who my point of contact is for the survey project. Um, and so they're, you know, just needing to probably hear back from one county um, on that. And of course, if there's more than one person, that's fine too. You know, maybe you can't decide if it's, you know, one single person. And so it's really good to work with more than one as well. And that's also uh, what's going on with some of the other folks as well. So uh, don't be shy and just let me know um, whom I should be working with. And then of course, I will be doing some communications with your teams um, on the larger sort of output that you're doing, you know, once you've got that lined up as far as the, your launch date, as well as your end date, and your unique URL, um, and maybe any other uh, sort of initial uh, products that you need to get started. Uh, of course, we're sharing that with the wider county team. One thing I see with these cohorts is that um, when we get done with this presentation the second week and talk about uh, survey distribution, that um, we end up really going back and kind of questioning our other um, aspects of uh, the program where we talk about team building and how you're doing communications amongst yourselves. Um, and so um, today, uh, you've, you've got my contact information here. Uh, today, we are going to talk a little bit about the networking and communications, which will be really key um, and speak to the effectiveness of um, your survey distribution. It's going to be really important to reach all parts of the county. One reason why this is an ag-focused um, effort is because in the broadband world, we often see that uh, places with high population density have more options for deployment. There's more companies that are interested in deploying uh, because they see, uh, you know, the, the potential of a lot of subscriptions to their service. And so they, that works for their business model. But, you know, with the ag focus in some of our counties that might not have um, a, a really big uh, urban or micro urban even um, type of place, uh, then, um, you know, we have other, other, other things to offer. We're, you know, agriculturally productive. We're feeding ourselves and others. And so that's quite the proposition for um, investment and deployment. And uh, we're going to use that to our advantage. However, in terms of the survey, we do want to make sure that we're not only getting those ag businesses and ag um you know, residents and uh, farms and things to fill out this survey, but we still want to get uh, main um, organizations in the community, um, people who, you know, maybe on housing assistance, so working with that housing authority, um, and, you know, po pockets of the county that might not um, speak up or be a part of the process, right, um, in some of these projects you do. Uh, you know, folks that might be struggling and so they're not participating as much uh, or empowered as much, um, how are we going to strategize on that distribution to really um, work on getting a, a lot of information collection done? Um, today, we're going to go over design. Um, we're going to go over sampling. Again, that's all going to speak to distribution, and I'll speak to what that looks like and what you're going for. Um, coverage is a way to check back in every week and see how we're doing and move our sampling processes along from convenience to cluster sampling. And then maybe a little bit about analysis and what to expect with that um, and our timeline. 
And so a survey process is more than just um, getting a survey out in front of folks and um, saying, let's all fill this out and then we can call it um, you know, valid and we can call it um, you know, truth finding. You know, we really have to do a little bit of like work before the, the distribution of the survey um, in that you're going to see that you want to have some communications going on with other parts of your county that maybe they're not here today sitting on your teams yet. Um, so you'll see that maybe you'll be adding a few extra team members even after today and saying, hey, come on, let's be, you know, you, you be part of this process too. And, um, you know, that empowerment can really um, get a, a participatory group together and make this distribution process a lot easier. Um, so you're going to want to find people who can represent the geographic area and population to be surveyed. Um, and that's really for the goal that should be everybody. Um, people from organizations which may act on the results of the survey. And I'll also add people who can speak, can really serve as that bridge to a, a quieter part of the county or, you know, maybe folks that you see you think might be reticent to fill out the survey. Um, groups that can contribute resources needy, needed in conducting the survey. So if you've got organizations, individuals, um, maybe you have a youth uh, organization, you know, some folks that can really help some, with some of the canvassing, um, maybe make some callbacks and do some phone administered surveying, um, things like that, uh, then you, you want to make sure you get sort of that labor side of things on going on as well. Uh, media professionals who can help disseminate the information. So, you know, sometimes I talk about, yeah, you might have a local radio station. I had mentioned uh, um, a few weeks ago on um, uh, RFD radio, you know, if they if you, you, you're interested in that, then let me know. But also you have local media, um, you've got local social media, you've got your local traditional media. Um, and then you might see that there's somebody who's just very kind of popular or influential in your county or in your communities. You should really kind of consider them as a person who can um, share the information as well. Um, and service and social organizations to provide volunteers, which I had sort of touched on that. And uh, so this is a bit of a process where you're um, doing some stakeholder identification as well and identifying those distribution partners. And so the worksheet I'll give you today will kind of, um, you know, make you list out a little bit what the, who those folks are and uh, those respective marketing channels. So what's the name of their organization? Who would be the point of contact? Could you find their contact information and get it written down? And then who on your team will serve to recruit that person or just reach out to that person, inform them of what's going on and um, get their help in getting the word out about the survey. And so just a few suggestions about always making sure that you've got that county health department person, the library, the school, and the housing authority. These are going to be really important entities to include uh, because um, the broadband development process is not just going to be the infrastructure deployment. You know, someday you're going to still want to speak with these entities about how you are providing digital access in other ways um, and how. Um, people are able to have access to get connectivity and be included in some of the, the digital activities that speak to quality of life, telehealth, e-commerce, et cetera. I could list them down. Um, you're, you've all bought into that already because you're here. So I won't go into that, but um, inclusion in that way to, to really let people um, uh, begin with you while you're doing this digital access work um, and inf uh, infrastructure planning work. Okay, and so um, for the design, as I said, um, we have a base survey. I sent that out last week for you to test drive. Um, we can look through it again today, uh, just for anybody who hasn't had their eyes on it, we'll go through that. The introductory survey text is what your 
residents and businesses and farmers and such will see as soon as they open that survey. So you're going to want to have a sort of a really good hook uh, to kind of explain to them why you're doing this and to thank them for their time and provide a contact of whom they should contact if they have a concern. Um, and so in terms of design, we've got that design ready for you. We just need for you to um, provide a little bit of that lead in information and then you will have a link that is different from this test survey link. It'll be your link. And of course, we'll give you a really pretty um, go link, uh, uh, short URL to disseminate, especially when you're doing a little bit more of the flyer work. You know, for those who don't have um, access to the internet and filling out a survey about access to the internet, that's going to be very important um, to have those alternative ways that you're reaching out. Um, and so send uh, questions and additions in the, the introdu introductory language, um, that will be fine. And um, you can totally have a, a little bit of input about that. And we can talk about if there's something that needs to be tweaked with your unique survey. And so also, you know, on these slides today, I'll be providing a little bit of um, meat that you can use for uh, your emails, email communications that you might be doing, the social media communications and press releases. And, um, you know, even think about where you want to put your logo and maybe do you want to create another one uh, for this, this initiative? Um, all that's up to you. And uh, that can also be um, accommodated in the design if you want to have um, some of that, um, the, those graphics in there too. And so to speak a little bit about the, the sampling, um, it's important to get responses. If you want to do a random sample, um, that's where we'd be able to say, yeah, these results are statistically valid because we've generated from a, a, a full list of perhaps utility users in your county. We've, we've, um, we've done a random sample of maybe around 400 or, or less, um, uh, maybe more, uh, just because it's all random sample. And so it would be, you know, sort of representative of your population demographics if it's a random sample. But um, that does, you know, implicate some resources. Uh, you, it, it's not free to generate a random sample um, because you usually have to act on that random sample um, with your partner, which would probably be like the utility company, for example, um, and uh, get um, uh, or get, get the data in another way, pay for the data, um, and maybe even send out the the um, the survey via mail. So even just mailing costs are also um, you know something to take into account. So most people find that the random sample is hard. We um, have so far uh, basically done this with as a convenient sample and then moving to cluster sampling. Uh, so the convenient sample is really just you push it out however you can to the best of your ability. And those who are filling out the survey are those who find it most convenient to do so. And then we start looking at um, who has uh, filled out the survey based on the address information they've provided and the um, you know, seeing where we're getting that speed test data from, and we're starting to see the the county populate with um, the survey um, responses. And when we see that there are parts of the county, you'll see that you just aren't really taking into account with that survey distribution, and that's when we start to be to go into more targeting types of activities. Um, when we're looking at coverage. And so that's what that cluster sampling um, methodology is. And so even if you can't say that, you know, statistically speaking, this is the state of broadband access in your county, you can show what we like to do is provide a map. Shubika's great at that. Um, we like to provide a map where it shows the coverage and the results in different ways. And I think that that's going to really speak to the overall situation in your county. And so you will be able to also explain 
the methods of distribution, all of that will really strengthen your case uh, if you're putting all of this into like a grant narrative, for example. The other thing you can do to speak to validity is to collect demographic information. We currently don't have those demographic questions on the survey, but if you're interested in that, we can add them in. The demographic, um, having the demographic information of those who were surveyed and comparing it to the overall population demographics is just another way to say that though that the sample, the overall sample of responses that you did get were representative of your county. So let me know if you're interested in random sampling. Let me know if you're in, interested in collecting demographic information. Um, otherwise, I still believe that it is strong to do targeting and cluster sampling along with that initial convenience sampling um, and using coverage for, uh, you know, consistently looking at coverage in, uh, to do that. And that that really does provide um, community sentiment around broadband um, access, speed, affordability, and reliability. This is just some bullet points about distribution. A lot of this I've said, um, you can, these are some ideas for you. Um, a lot of this I've mentioned as ways that you can get the word out. Um, you will want to include a phone number to call on those flyers uh, so that there's a, you know, a way for somebody to leave a message and say, I'd like a call back and someone can call them, ask them the questions over the phone and enter their survey responses into a survey and submit for them. In that case, they won't be submitting speed data, but what they will be saying is that person didn't have access to the internet at their residence or business or farm. The only other thing I didn't mention is maybe you wanna have events and expos, maybe you have some events coming up, maybe your all the organizations that you want to implicate in the distribution process as you're, as you're networking, maybe they have events. And so really try to utilize those opportunities where people are gathering to have, you know, that's a cluster sample as well. It's very, it can be very effective and, um, you know, make sure that you're aware of that and try to, to really um, take advantage of those opportunities and, and ride um, on those, um, on those uh, vehicles. Nancy, there's a question in the chat about the data uh, safety or who gets access to look at the data. Okay. You want to speak talk to that? About that a little bit? Is that a, mm -hmm. timely? That's fine. Yeah. So, um, of course, our collection is done by U of I Extension. Um, we're here at the U of I. Uh, I went through an, an institutional review board process. Uh, and got a designation of not for human subject research, which means that this is uh, not research. It is a cooperative service um, given by extension to the counties. And so the data belongs to the counties. Does that answer your question? Well, and then I think it's up to really to the team leaders to take a look and say, how, how are we gonna use this data? And so, we provide kind of the raw survey responses to folks. And so we, you know, you're going to be able to see who's responded, what their comments were, and so on. And you might want to establish a committee that uh, really focuses on that and limit the access to that data. Uh, you know, we're not asking really for incomes or uh, any kind of real personal information that would be considered very controversial, but people may say, well, you know, either, you know, I, here's what I think about my internet service provider, and that can get a little spicy sometimes, but I, I think that your committee will own this and um, be able to use it as you feel is really appropriate. Mm -hmm. One of the things that so we... Oh, Sorry, so Bill or Nancy, will will either of your organizations, so you guys will also keep the data for your use as well? Uh, so we, you know, as far as the how we use the data, it's very minimal. Um, I can say that, you know, with working with the counties, 
there's some times that we will look into that data and maybe try to add extra analysis. Um, one thing that we are very keen on doing is uh, providing that as a cooperative service, even you know once the program has ended, if you have questions about your data, you know you call, you give me a call, we can take a look at that again. Um, we haven't, you know, lumped it all together and provided any sort of analysis on, you know, in terms of any sort of research. So, um, you know, and of course, if somebody if somebody calls to ask for the data that's not really from your steering okay. team, I direct them to your steering team. Um, okay, that's, you know. that's the main question I have is is basically, you know, if as long, I mean, if I can it's fine to say, hey, take this survey. And if somebody says, well, you know, my address is in there, this is in there, you know, I've got, there's personal information. And, and then I, if I can Let's, say, well, it's going to be only used by us and, you know, the U of I extension office or whatever, then if I can feel confident about telling people that, then that, that will help me or help us, I think as a, there will be some concern about that around here for sure. Let's test drive the survey. There's a question on the survey about, um, a permission to share that information and they get to say yes or no. And so if the county wants a list of addresses that you know were were given to them with the permission to share uh, with an internet service provider that they end up partnering with, um, then um, that we we give them that list. Here's the folks that said it's okay. You know, you have this larger set of data, but here's the folks that said it's okay, right? Um, and so I think it's important that, you know, that question is there and so that people feel like, okay, I can give this information um, and know that they're not going to share it because I said no. Um, and the other thing is that the survey is kind of long, but none of the questions are required. So for example, you have to answer this question or you can't go to the next page. That's, that doesn't happen. If you, you know, if you fill out the survey and you only answer the questions that, you, that you're comfortable answering, we let you do that. And we analyze each question with, of those who responded to the question, here's the percentage that said this or that. And so that looks different for, you know, the analysis is a bit different. We don't, you, we don't say of, you know, of all the people who took the survey, this is how many said this. We never say that. We say of all the people who responded to this question, this survey question, here's who said. This okay, that, that and, answers the question. That's right, so, so it's important. going to, yeah, it's gonna be, you know, pretty thoughtful. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is always going to be some hesitancy. I really like those challenges because it speaks to how we need to sensitize around some of the survey distribution for the infrastructure deployment. And so please bring those to my attention each time because I really think that kind of working through those, there are different ways that we can address those concerns. And our team is here. Um, we are all you know, willing to take a phone call get on a like a meeting you maybe you have a group of people maybe you're finding that the distribution efforts are really stagnating in the county that people just simply don't want to fill it out for one reason or another because that happens you know sometimes in counties they can say well you know here's a reason and so because of this reason um, and I heard this and that you know we're not going to do this this work or we're not going to participate and it can be something very sort of socially driven right it it might not be a privacy concern so a lot of time it is um, but it can be something else um, and we kind of know how it works in some of these like maybe smaller towns or whatever you know um, if if someone feels a certain way that makes a difference and so what do you want to do about it let's talk about it and bring it to my attention uh, because we can do all kinds of things. Um, and we can have even, you know, additional sort of meetings. Maybe you wanna get a forum together. That's really an effective way to not only address the concerns, maybe get some people to come and listen about the efforts, 
maybe you want to have myself or Robbie or Bill or somebody just come and uh, speak to the group or, um, you know, maybe it's uh, an online forum to, to speak to the group. Um, but uh, that's also a place where we can get some survey responses too. So it could be a, a really good um, option. So I really appreciate your concerns on that. Now let's um, just Nancy, take a look at this. Nancy, sure. we have one more question, sorry. Question. So um, we're all in sales up to a point. And so a lot of people are gonna say, well, what's in it for me? So how do we sell this survey to them because yeah. they're not going to want to take the 10 minutes to do this survey. Uh, survey. Yeah. Benefit them at all. Yeah. So similar to the other question, you know, once we drive the survey and you look at some of the other slides I've got for you on messaging points and communication points, you'll find some answers to these questions you've got. So bear with me here and Perfect. let's let's drive this survey. And, um, you know, listen to the rest of my talk here. Of course, any question you have, please put it in the chat so that you remember and so that it gets addressed at any time. All right, so let's look at the survey. And I'm gonna share my screen with that base survey. There it is. Okay, so um, this is a placeholder for your introductory test text, and you will um, sort of use this to kind of finalize your intro. I won't spend much time on it because I think most everyone has done their introductory text. Um, what kind of property are you taking this survey from? Home, business, farm, community, public building. This question makes other things appear. Um, if they choose business, we want to know, um, no, if they choose farm, there's quite a few uh, questions that will appear. If they choose community building, we want to know what is it? Is it a hospital? You know, they'll have to just write that in. We, we'd like to know. For the purposes of the survey, I'm going to choose farm so that we can see those additional questions. We want to know, is it leased or not? Um, because uh, we want to know if it's a landowner or operator um, and, you know, sort of what does, what do those activities look like? Because that speaks to, um, that speaks to the, the type of farm we're looking at. And we'll, we'll kind of look at um, the other responses to the survey in regards to how this breakdown looks. But usually we see so far that it's about half and half landowner versus operator. We collect property address and email address. Then we ask if they're comfortable sharing those things. Um, we have this very important access question. Uh, they can indicate if they have fixed internet, if they have cell cellular uh, data that they work from as well. They can um, indicate if they have um, working computers, uh, tablets, uh, smartphones, um, and then any other sort of smart devices such as medical or, or security. Um, and so they're going to they're going to answer that, and that just sort of speaks to infrastructure as well. Uh, we we like to know that information. It also speaks to adoption of internet access uh, once it's there. Um, how well does your current fixed non-cellular internet connection support your connectivity needs? And so they're going to rate from excellent to poor how it works for business functions, precision ag functions, and family life. And they're going to also give the same ratings for cellular. So I chose both when it asked if I have access to you know, regular internet, local internet, uh, such as with a provider, um, and you know whether or not I use internet on my cell phone. So both of these appear, and I'm going to give some ratings on how that connection works for me there. And how does your cellular service cover the entire farm? That's going to be um, important for folks to, to talk about. So they're going to be able to get, they're going to get a chance uh, to do that. A lot of these are rating questions. Okay, farm, you know, 
if you chose farm or ag property, you're going to get more questions. Oh, it's important to us to know. And uh, it's important to us to know that um, uh, they have certain uses that they're already um, um, employing in terms of digital ag. And uh, we, we want to know um, to what extent as well. Would you be interested in hosting wireless internet equipment on your property? Yes or no? And, and you know, that's, I think that's a great question. And uh, you won't be surprised when you get the answers, right? Uh, but maybe you will be a little bit. Um, this degree of benevolence uh, in everybody. Um, and so who is your primary internet provider? Um, so this is- Nancy. I just want to point out that now this you're kind of back in the regular survey, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So th those are farm questions are done. We've clicked to the next page and we're now back sort of talking to everybody um, who no matter what property type they selected. Thank you so much, Bill. Right, and then people who don't select, if they select home, they won't see all those ag questions. Collect, correct. Okay. Um, so these are just, you know, this is not what your list is going to look like. Everybody so far, um, I've changed those questions. At the county level, we, we know uh, generally what your providers are that have um, already, you know, sort of touched down in your area. And so that question will be um, tailored to your county on which internet provider is your primary internet, internet provider. Um, and so they'll be able to just um, click on that specific list. Do you have to use your cell data plan when your primary internet connection is not working? Speaks to reliability. We want to know how often they have to get, you know, go go back and forth and say, oh, I got to use my data now. I can't use my my um, local internet anymore because I'm in a certain part of the house or, you know, whatever. So, um, or, you know, certain types of things are going on. We just want to know how often. Um, and then we want to know, the internet service provider promised you what speeds download and upload. And of course they can say they don't know as well, but um, we like to know what's promised. And then of course we, um, we can compare that and see, see what is um, promised versus what the reality might be um, at any given time. And levels of satisfaction. These are real, this is a real key question that we report on after you've finished uh, your survey um, initiative. You know, we want to see how many people think that it's affordable, um, that it's fast, and that it's reliable. And so we have levels of satisfaction, extremely satisfied to extremely dissatisfied. Now we're doing speed tests. We're going to provide a speed test based on that access question of whether or not they have the local, you know, fixed non-cellular um, internet service. They're going to provide, they're going to go to the speed test. It's going to take them out away out off of the page into a new tab or a new window. They're going to take it and then they're going to come back and they're going to give the results. Same thing for the cell connection. You may now submit speed test data for your local cellular connection. I think actually um, we end up bolding these so that they can see that. And um, on your unique survey, you might see that that's bolded so people can know, okay, we're doing a speed test for both types of connection, connections. So this does speak to messaging, right? On how you wanna tell folks that you're, they're going to be looking at how their local internet is working and how their cellular data connection is working. So, because you always see it's sort of all lumped together. People talk about my internet's not working. Sometimes they're talking about their cell phone. Sometimes they're talking about um, their, their actual um, provider. So we want to know. Um, we want to know the difference and we want to know. I think there's struggles in both of those camps. And um, we want to see, you know, what are people willing to pay for high speed service? We want to see what they're using their internet connectivity for. Saw the great suggestion about um, online shopping. 
Um, and so, you know, that that's not, I think that that would be a great addition to this list, right? Uh, we, we tend to kind of um, look at these different types of ways that one can use the internet. Mm -hmm. And this question also speaks to a way that you can do your messaging. People say, well, why should I care? Here's a reason why you okay. should care. Um, so I'm wondering uh, when we were going to hear from him. Yeah. And so let me mute that person. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. Let's, um, let's keep rolling here. So do you feel like there's a sufficient amount of internet service providers at your location? And they can say yes or no. They might not be speaking to the county, but they might be speaking to their location in the county. They're part of the county. Finally, at the end, we've geared them up to start thinking about these different aspects of their service. Now they're going to really give us their story. This is where all those stories happen, where people talk about, I was filling out a job application and I hit next and everything got lost. You know, there's just so many crazy broadband stories out there. And so we give them a chance to vent in that portion. Um, and so are there any questions about this? If there are, uh, put them in the chat and we'll get to them here in just a moment. I'm going to just finish these slides quickly and we won't um, spend much time uh, on the slides much longer so that we can get to your questions and concerns because I know that there will be some, this is a lot of information and we want to um, you know, be mindful of getting those questions answered. I think there's been a very good question uh, answered about the safety and anonymity of the data. Nancy, maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, and we will, yep, let's talk about that. Um, and so, do you see my screen for my slide? Yes. Okay, and so we were almost done with these. Another just sort of, um, you know, I think it, some of these slides are just useful for you. Uh, writing out some of the messaging you might want to have on your different products for this survey distribution. Again, uh, you know, just giving sort of an idea of why they should be participating in this survey. We had a great question about that and, you know, wondering how to talk to people about how um, good connection to the internet is important for many areas of life, um, such as education, telehealth, um, and giving a little bit of resources as well so that you can say, according to the USDA, improved decision making, planning, production, market coordination, you know, those types of, um, you know, lending credibility to what you're saying, as well as making sure you communicate the different ways that um, internet connectivity and digital access can improve one's quality of life and the overall economy and society within your county is really, within your county and beyond really, is um, going to be really key. Um, so and we know that a, a good portion of your counties either live or work there and maybe not both. And so you're serving them as well. And so, um, it's really important. Um, and so I've kind of given it a shot and giving a little bit of me more messaging ideas here so that you can um, you know, work from that and use it in either talking points or as you're getting information out and um, you know, answering questions for folks. Just a, maybe a little template for a flyer. You can um, kind of see this, you can pull it off of the slide or you can um, let me know if you'd like me to give you something different here, but just another, uh, another little way to just say, um, here's what we're doing and um, here's the information, email address, phone, website, those types of things. And then this list right. of um, efforts and timeline this is just going to help you with your, just go down the list. When you're in your breakout rooms, just go down the list and try to um, talk about all of these points and um, see if, you know, you can kind of plot out the dates so that as those dates arrive, you're, you know, you're doing the proper communications. I'm going to be able to give you some of those dates as well, right? I'm going to be able to tell you, hey, 
I'm going to pull your data on this date. I'm going to give myself 48 hours to analyze it or 72 hours to analyze it. And so by this date, you should have your results. Some of that will be there. So um, let's move on and finish and start the conversation. Again, here's the little planning tool. I'm going to put links to the survey as well as the slides as well as the planning tool in the chat. You'll use those in your breakout rooms. And in those breakout rooms, you're gonna uh, assign somebody who's gonna kind of work with that planning tool. Everybody's gonna contribute ideas. You're gonna do some of that stakeholder identification in your teams today. Um, and you're gonna get that distribution plan done. And uh, you know we'll be checking in with you and I'm really happy to have, you know, offshoot conversations with you, phone call, um, additional meetings, whatever it takes for you to kind of get over this initial curve and into launching the survey. So Adrian, that's it. I'm going okay. to go ahead and take this down and let's hear from Adrian first. I see that hand up and, yeah. um, and start I know some I'm discussion. I'm going to anticipate what Adrian's going to ask about all the questions in the chat. No, 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 no. Okay. I had a question. Uh, there was a slide before the timeline slide, Nancy. Um, and you mentioned cellular there. But then, of course, we are saying they can take the speed test on cellular. It says do not take the survey. If you could pull it up again, that would be helpful so that I just make sure that I know the answer to that. Sorry to make you put the slides up again. You want the slides. Um, and let me do that. I'm not for sure what you're asking. Yeah, it'll be so obvious. In the old days, we didn't do the cellular, but we started. Now, this is the first time we're going to measure cellular speeds. Right. So this is the this is slide number 10. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. OK, let's update that. That's what I meant. It's the one that says for uh, sorry, please take the survey using your local Wi-Fi, not your cellular connection. This is going well, to be I, different. Thank um, you. I just wanted to make sure that because we are allowing for the first time to have the uh, cellular speed test, I guess what needs to be clarified is, can you take the survey using your cellular phone? Sure. OK, so that's I've got I'm that in, on another um, slide here, um, as well as on the tool. Okay. And so and as well as on the base survey. And so that introductory test text also speaks to that. Be aware of whether you are connected to your local connection. We want you to be connected to your local connection first. If you don't have a local connection, it's just the cell connection. So it's a little bit hard to kind of speak to everybody in their individual situations um, in that case. So I think the text that I had um, was really just be aware of if you are connected to your local internet connection or your cellular data, you will have the opportunity to take speed tests from both of those connections. And, you know, that might be, I think that'll be important for the bulk of survey takers. I, um, we see that, a, you know, a good amount of people do have both um, and that, you know, that service will, you'll also see um, and not be surprised that the services are not very satisfactory as well. Um, but yeah, in some counties, they really don't. You'll see a lower percentage of people who have that local internet connection even to take the speed test. Um, uh, so good, yeah, some, some of that is gonna happen. And so we should really, you know, you, you shouldn't hesitate to talk about your unique county situation and what's best for communications and wording for you. And so that's another purpose of these breakout rooms today. You know, the design and tailoring those products for messaging and distribution are gonna be really key. And let's, let's kind of get all of that out and make sure that we're really thinking about a thoughtful way to do this in the different counties that, that are doing this. Good, thanks, Nancy. I see there's questions in the chat. We're going to come back to those, but I want to get to our guest, uh, Barbara Klein from Lesur uh, County, Minnesota. 
and uh, Barbara's uh, 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 person who returned home to our rural roots and uh, in Lesueur County and uh, after living in uh, Northern California for a while and uh, bought a nice place and then found out no internet. And uh, since that day, uh, enlightened self-interest has uh, led her to become a uh, extremely strong community broadband champion. Uh, she's been very successful in helping to get fiber to the farm deployed in Lesueur County, as well as some uh, what she believes is temporary fixed wireless services. And uh, uh, is now a member of the Minnesota Broadband Task Force, helping to bring the rural community voice to uh, St. Paul and uh, uh, do battle with the uh, the big internet service providers in many cases to bring a equity a lens to her to our policy choices. So she's a, a, a great role model for uh, for all of you. Uh, they've done a great job doing community surveys and making that actionable. One of the things I when we think about the purpose of this survey, Number one, I think when Barbara started was to convince their own local government officials that broadband was important to the community. Uh, number two is to convince a broadband provider partner uh, to be interested in uh, working with your community, uh, that there's a market there, that there's a collaborative partner is there. And then third, and I think Barbara's been very effective in this, is convincing the granting agencies about the uh, desire for broadband in the community and the uh, marketplace that there is to make it a sustainable broadband project. And so Barbara, I'm gonna call on you and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Um, and it was great to sit through your discussion because um, we've done it very piecemeal in Minnesota. I'm really, really impressed with how you're doing this through county extension. I'm going to talk with Bill more about that afterwards. But um, we were bland and broadband community, and that's what got us started. Bill had us bring all the providers in a room, which was a great experience. And some of them told us they were never going to build out more, but they would challenge anybody else. And that has been held to be true all this time. We did our uh, survey in 2019, our first one, similar to yours, but yours is better. And I wanted to add that um, this is, I tried to make my notes linear, but it's really a circular process because this is really starting an activity and community organizing in your area in a different way. And I really would hope that you can find someone like, now I was a volunteer the first year, I then became on as a consultant. I'm fortunate that I was I used to be a, a county department head, so I had really good connections in the county already. But um, this is really an evolving process. Um, so our first survey, we did um, ads in the newspaper. We did um, a, a K Check radio survey. We had a, a community organizing group that we connected up with. And we have had, I think now we've had five county broadband fairs and including a booth at the county fair three years now. And we've gotten in, had a chance to engage and talk to people there. The biggest thing I can advice I can give you about your survey, if you can do this, is we were able to download email addresses to constant contact. I now have a list of 1,200 people on constant contact. It has grown since 2019. And I'm the only one that communicates with them. We get a really good response rate in terms of opening up. And now we've added the component of we can actually do social media from constant contact too. We have a Facebook page. So um, the constant contact emails have been brilliant in terms of connecting and communicating with people. And I think the biggest message you want to give with your survey is you are giving people hope. I have, so let me continue and then I'll go more on that. So we did the five county fairs, which has been, so we did the county, but about the county fair, we also had providers come in and that was really interesting. Providers, it encouraged providers to look at where they might build out more. We had one provider come in. 
who lied completely about what they were able to do, took down names and said they'd sign up for fiber this summer. So we had to uh, not invite them to future fairs. Um, the K Check Radio was great. It covers a huge area besides Lee Sir County. So that's kind of a risk. But the funny story from that is I was at our uh, local neighborhood bar and this guy in a flannel shirt says to me, are you the broadband lady? I said, yeah. And I, he said, why am I paying $200 for internet? I said, you're not. You're, I knew where he lived. I said, you're not. You're paying 100 bucks for television. Get net, go to Radio Shack, get an antenna. He said, that's what my kids told me too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, another a, a challenge of ours is still the county website. We didn't create a separate website because it's a big capacity to be able to do that. Our county website is in need of a huge, huge upgrade, which they're now in the process of doing. That might make it better, but um, we've had to, that's been part of the, fragmentation there, but I want to talk about our second survey and why we did a second one. So um, we're, so we have, with our latest broadband grant, we're up to about a quarter of the county having fiber to the door. The rest of the county is going to be far, far more challenging. And we decided to do a second survey. And most of the people that did the first survey did the second survey. And I want to say your survey is fine. Don't think about changing it. This is something you could do afterwards as a refinement. So this is a GIS map survey. And it shows me by household who's got what there. As we're going ahead and finishing out our county, we have... I mean, literally with this next grant we have, I have one house on, one farm on there that couldn't be in the new grant because they're supposedly by another provider that never built out to them. I can click on that dot and get a phone number and call them or email them. So, so the GIS mapping part is really a great tool, but it's not something you need to do right away. And I gave Bill the information for the group that did that survey. But start with your first survey, and if you can download those addresses, get a constant contact account that's only used for broadband, people feel like they're connecting and they feel like there's some hope here. We have, it's one of the, so one of the people who's do, so we also just, because this is a new survey, we just sent out 22,000 postcards to the entire county. So, and, and I have to say, I have not been hounded by phone calls either. People are, are very, um, very conscious of time and not wanting to cause a fuss. Everybody's been really great to talk to. I have one person who called me this week who is very close to the town of Lee Center, not that far out, but she couldn't complete the survey because her survey speed is 2.66 down and 0.65 up. And that's at noon. That's not a high use time. So the challenge, and we want people to do it at their house, but sometimes that's truly a challenge. So sometimes people need to write that in there in terms of what they're, but she couldn't complete the rest of the survey. She got the speed test, but she couldn't complete the rest of the survey because her, her internet speed was so low. Um, we are, so as we move ahead, we are really refining our planning and trying to figure out how to get to some of those areas where there's some fiber and there's some gaps. And there are some gaps partly because of the challenge process where a company can, can come in and say they're going to build out, but they don't build out the whole area. They build out part of the area, which makes it more expensive to get in there. But one of the things that Minnesota just did is... Um, what's called a line extension program. It's a new pilot where you can, uh, a household can apply for up to $25,000 to have fiber built out to their house. We had one provider where the company was sold and they never finished building out. We had the email lists to do a campaign and we sent out 2000 letters to houses we think are close to fiber. And I just talked to the state, they are, um, there's, 800 applications in and Leeser County alone has almost 400 of them because of the network we created for communicating with our residents about what's possible for broadband coming ahead. So that is, I can't say enough about your survey. It is terrific. It will be a great use. It's a great way to, I see Bill's, uh, <laughs> I made Bill a hat for his uh, going away thing. Um, 
I, and I'm so impressed with what you're doing that you're working through extension. We are very fragmented in Minnesota. Everything is provider driven. I'm the first Bernadine from Blandon was a community person on the broadband task force. I'm the second community person. It's all providers. It's a lot provider driven. And what you guys are doing is phenomenal. It's really exciting. And I'm going to talk and Bill, I'm having dinner tonight with a farmers union people. And I'm going to talk to them about trying to pick something like this up across the state because it's very fragmented here and there's a ton of money coming down and you guys are really laying a fabulous groundwork to move ahead. Thank you, Barbara. That's, uh, it's great that you've uh, been able to use these surveys in so many ways uh, for your, not only for the, the purposes I talked about, but this idea of gathering, you know, people who are really interested in broadband keeping them informed and and uh, and motivating them when necessary to call their county commissioners or uh, call their legislators or or uh, sign a petition or or whatever so thank you so much for that information one more I love one my more. hat it's maroon yes. and gold <laughs> made me a custom one for my gopher football games and one more. Uh, I want to make one more funny comment Bill so one of our, at, we only had an angry person at one of our broadband fairs, which we held at the 4-H building at the county fairgrounds. Besides, So besides the county fair, we had four or five more. And it was great. People that were seniors could come in, drive up, park, easily come in and talk about it. So I, we're having a broadband fair and one of the volunteers comes up and says, there's a really angry person at the check-in. They won't leave until he talks to you. So it was a county commissioner that I used to work for when I was a department head there. <laughs> I sent him over to the local provider who looked up his address and he had gotten a postcard. He had, he had disregarded, he was being hooked up to broadband that spring, but it never called them because <laughs> he didn't read his postcard. So there's lots of value to the uh, having a face-to-face -face broadband fair too. Good, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Great, that's, uh, uh, Barbara, thank you so much. Uh, you're an inspiration, I think, uh, across rural Minnesota and like moving from that local leadership to state leadership, and I know I appreciate your work. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Nancy, uh, uh, it looks like you're, knocking on those questions in the chat. Anything there you wanna to say uh, to the entire group? I think the, um, you know, the question, it's always hard on these surveys to give people who don't know how to use their devices good information in a easy way to say, okay, go to settings. You know, do you have a Google phone? Do you have an iPhone? There's a lot of different challenges there to overcome. And what's your take on the value of trying to do that, Nancy? You're muted. Yeah, you don't want to get too specific because then you are giving somebody the wrong instructions. Uh, it, you know, like I mentioned, I think maybe best to just sort of go down these and even just say out loud uh, for those who are might be on a phone and needing to hear the responses as well. Um, I think what I say here is, um, depending on the device they are using, that method will vary. Even on cell phones, it varies between Android and iPhone. And so I'm willing to work with you to attempt some language on this and some of that meta metadata also helps. Um, so we want to, um, you know, assure that people don't get more confused. Sometimes you can help too much and it just, it becomes more confusing. Um, and so we do have a little bit of language on within the speed, during the speed tests as well on those questions, it kind of explains you're going to want to make sure that you're on your local internet connection. Mm -hmm you're going to want to make sure that you're on your data connection. I, if everyone had an iPhone, we could say, yeah, just swipe down and hit the icon for, you know, local internet versus that little ping cell tower that kind of is there. And we can provide a graphic, but then that's just for one device. 
um, though that icon for local internet connection is pretty universal. So I think using that icon, which is sort of, it's the dot with the little waves coming out. Um, and so that might be interesting to kind of insert that icon into the text. I, we have a rich text content editor in the survey um, platform that we're using. So we can actually kind of play around with that a little bit. Um, so I think that would be the limit to how specific we get though. Otherwise we're giving the wrong instructions to people because we don't, we simply don't know what device they're using. And so, um, you know, that is a limitation, right? We, we, we see limitations with all of these surveys. Um, there is no survey that um, doesn't have limitations. And so, um, you know, we can say uh, that, and that's why when we report the language, we say, serve, you know, survey takers reported that. So we're not saying county residents say this or county residents are experiencing this. We say those who took the survey reported that this and sometimes I even say self-reported so that you know people continue to be aware that you know there was not a witness I was not there physically I could not see the survey taker their unique situation and say for sure yes this is the truth um, and we do see that there is a margin of true of true of false in all of these self-reported survey responses, no matter what survey somebody's taking, there will always be a little bit of stretching the truth that someone might give, you know? So I think with some of these questions, we know that, okay, that's gonna be the truth, what they're saying. Some of these other questions, it might just be how they feel, right? I'm really, really not satisfied, even though my internet's better than maybe my neighbors, right? So, you know, all of that is, you know, based on, it's relevant, right? And so we do speak to that sort of relevant nature of the data as well. And so, you know, we're doing our best and we try to get all of, of the information together and provide, you know, with some level of confidence, not statistical level of confidence, but just some general level of confidence that, um, you know, if everybody's reporting the same thing, you know, if everybody's crying out the same story, then that really does start to have some weight and can be used to say that um, investment is needed. And so let me go down. There was a few other questions um, around uh, some of the, like, for example, the privacy. So um, who will have access to the information collected? And my answer is the data is secured on a secure network. It's not used as university research and it belongs to the county steering teams as a cooperative service to the counties. Uh, does Nancy's team do the survey results? I, in particular, will be securing and analyzing the survey results. Uh, Shabika Agarwal, who is also on our team, will also have access to the cleaned data sets. Um, there's a question about farm data. Um, so, you know, go ahead and put that question in the chat. I'll get to that. Um, The provider list, is the provider list updated for all areas? Yes, it is. Every county's survey will look different for that question. And uh, of course, thanks for that response, uh, Bill, uh, in saying that the FCC database um, has established who provides internet in each count county and we use those lists. Uh, we also have the option for them to add and write in another one um, that they, they use. Um, and so um, because we maybe we didn't see that on the list, maybe we used the list and there's a new provider that's relatively new and not updated to the FCC list, for example, that we're using. And so they get to write that in as well. And we do look at that when we show the ISP breakdowns um, in the results. We, we, we use all of those answers as well, not just the canned answers that we provided for you. Yeah, and if you're aware of a new provider that's not on the list, make sure you let Nancy know. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. And I, of course, in the survey, they'll let us know as well. And we look at that and we include that in the results. Um, so um, 
just a quick uh, concern about breakout rooms. I do uh, want to visit Edgar County first and then McLean. Um, and then Skylar Ogle and Hancock should just let me know um, who wants to see me after that. Uh, question about speed tests. Um, what if you can only do a speed test on a hotspot uh, in you know, the case where someone's um, farm doesn't have any services a very this question touches me personally right I have family members who are on farms that have just have hot spots and you know they really struggle um, so um, you know I say this the access question uh, in the beginning gives three responses as choices for the survey taker they can say I have local internet they can say I have internet with my cellular data or hotspot and they can say they don't have access. They can also choose both of those first two options together um, as well. And so when in your case with the hotspot, if they choose option two, then only the speed test for the cellular data slash hotspot will appear and they'll only see that. If they choose option three that they don't have access, no speed tests are even going to appear for them to take. Um, will there be instructions on how to turn on Okay, so again, um, we, we talked about that. You know, how do you, that's gonna be some tricky language. There will be users that don't often go back and forth between cell data and their local internet connection. I do it quite a bit. Um, actually, like I will find that the local cell connection on a certain time of day or day of the week isn't working well. I'll swipe down and get right on the cellular connection for my phone because I know that I can all of a sudden have like a better Zoom video with somebody or a FaceTime video with my mother or whatever, uh, because um, it just so happens that the local internet connection is not working well, but not everybody knows that and they just sort of, you know, see that the phone has both on. And so it's going back and forth, kind of always fetching. Uh, which, you know, again, that takes up a lot of data. It takes up a lot of battery to be consistently fetching um, the, the, the speeds and, and fetching other types of, um, of, of things. Again, another concern about personal identifying information, uh, what's captured in the metadata. The metadata captures the IP address, the duration it took for the survey to be completed, the geo coordinates, that's latitude and longitude, and that's it. So um, within our secure network here on campus, I keep the data secure and I can remove the meta metadata uh, when I share the data with the um, steering team. The other thing I can do is remove the med metadata as soon as I export the data and not even look at it. Um, and so you can let me know. Um, I think with the metadata, what it tells me is that if some of that's blank and I look at some of those responses, they're not actual survey submissions. Somebody went through, they kind of looked at it, they didn't answer it at all and they got off and it didn't collect meta metadata because they didn't even you know, load one single response or they didn't even, you know, they weren't even able to load properly you know or something like that um very very small amount of cases uh but um you know when the metadata is all there it kind of tells us that it's a bona fide uh survey that was submitted um we don't usually use that met metadata for anything uh, again we like to use the reported address that the person gives us to provide the information about whether or not they're satisfied with their internet, for example. Um, so um, it's been very rarely we've used geo coordinates. Um, I think out of curiosity, I've plotted both geo coordinates and addresses just to see if there's like a really big difference. Um, that was in the beginning when we were piloting. Um, and so I'm, I, um, you know, since that was very underwhelming, I don't really see a, a use for the very minimal metadata that is collected. And again, it's um, stored in a secure place and um, can be shared with your team as you like. Again, the questions on whether or not they can share their address or email, the, those answers will be respected. You know, if they say no, we use that, we filter that out. 
um, and um, we we make sure that that information is not shared out. And let's see if we have new questions. Identification of the farmer type um, at the beginning. Yes. So um, what's so owner versus operator? Let me see if you want to really see that again. Um, are folks interested in seeing that? Let's just take that offline, Nancy. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. You can take and it offline. Sure. I just okay. wanted it, it's essentially a farmer might be he also might it, it depending on the location that he's at it might be a farmhand taking mm -hmm. um that survey at that location or you know it so i think it's location based rather than exactly but we can take it offline yes um i really am interested in that conversation if you tell me that some different language should be used in terms of owner versus operator um, then um, Bill and I will really listen to that and talk about if that's an implication for the other surveys as well. Um, we always see that, you know, with each time we work with a cohort, uh, there's a little bit of tweaking those surveys after this, this session, this presentation, for example, um, because we get that feedback from you guys and we hear sort of the different um, communication styles um, and um, naming conventions for things that vary across the counties. So we really are happy to, to accommodate that and learn more with you. There's one more question, Nancy. Is an individual able to access and review the information they submitted? No. It's an easy answer. Yeah. It's just technically kind of really difficult to, to do that. Um, at the same time, I, I suppose that that person can contact the contact name that's on the survey and ask them um, if they can get that info. And I, I guess I could go, go in and get it for them if, they, if that's really important to them. Maybe they invested a lot of time. They felt they invested a lot of time in really filling out that survey thoughtfully um, and they want to get that back. I mean, I, I guess that's okay. I, I don't think that'll happen very much. So. You know, now if everybody starts asking for that, that's quite a, yeah, that's, that's no. quite a phenomenon. No <laughs> so good. All right. I think we're going to go to our rooms now. And uh, Nancy, how do they access that worksheet? Let's put those in the chat. Um, so I've got the, the worksheet and I've got the slides. And let me put those in the chat uh, as well. And then um, you, let's see, we've got five breakout rooms. And how many minutes would you want to leave for the breakout rooms? Well, I mean, we're at 9.52. So, I mean, our meeting ends at, uh, you know, 10.30. But if you just want to leave it open till 11, I'm sure that's good. Right. And we I've won't come back off. now. So, We'll Correct. just, we're uh, once, and this is generally the case, once we go to the breakout rooms, we don't really come back to the main room for more discussion or anything. You can just adjourn when you, at your pleasure. Okay, so I'll put it on for 60 minutes and open those up. Um, again, you know, if you've got uh, trouble joining the room, I will help you by putting you in that room. Then I'll be... Um, visiting Edgar County first. Good. Thank you, Nancy, for all your work on this. It's a big Thanks, big everyone. Job. I'm looking forward to um, helping everyone out and uh, learning from them as well. Nancy, can you save the chat? You bet. There's a question about the wanting to see that. And to be clear, we're not meeting back here afterwards, right? This is correct. Okay. Okay, and um, I'll go ahead and turn off the recording and we'll see you next week.